Sepsis is a major concern in healthcare today, with 1.7 million cases per year and 270,000 deaths annually, according to the CDC. Sepsis is caused by an infection in the blood. The most common cause is gram-positive bacteria, but it can be caused by other types of bacteria, as well as viruses, fungi, or parasites. The presence of drug-resistant organisms also increases the risk of sepsis, and we're seeing these more and more in the hospital setting, in long-term care, so early monitoring and prevention of sepsis are very important, and we'll get into that more later. Sepsis can affect any patient, but some factors increase this risk, including older age, chronic illness, burns, or malnutrition. Patients who are immunosuppressed are at higher risk. So patients who have HIV, who are undergoing chemotherapy or corticosteroid use, we wanna monitor even more closely. Also patients who've had invasive procedures or devices. So PICC lines, IVs, post-operative wounds, any areas that infection can be entering the body we want to be monitoring those areas for infection and also monitoring the patient for any signs of a more systemic infection. Currently, one in three patients who die in the hospital have sepsis. Looking now at the pathophysiology of sepsis. We know that sepsis is an infection in the bloodstream, but why is it so severe? Well, the infection in the blood quickly circulates throughout the body and initiates widespread inflammation and decreased tissue perfusion that can lead to organ damage or death. This begins with an infective agent in the blood. It could be bacteria, virus, fungi, or parasite. Most commonly, we do see that gram-positive bacteria, but it could be any of these factors. In the first stage, it's called SIRS, Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome. That's widespread inflammation due to the action of the white blood cells and chemicals released to fight the infection. In contrast, in a typical localized infection, the white blood cells damage the antigen and may cause some damage to surrounding tissue in the process. Also, the blood vessels expand and become more permeable to allow the white blood cells to get to the infected area. But in sepsis, this process is occurring throughout the entire bloodstream, resulting in widespread vasodilation, leaking of blood vessels, and damage to the blood vessels. As the blood vessels are damaged, coagulation factors begin clotting to try to repair the blood vessels, but there's so much damage that now there's an abundance of clots throughout the bloodstream and the blood vessels are also damaged in the lungs resulting in respiratory distress as well. So there's a lot going on. As sepsis progresses in this way, it will develop into septic shock. And this is when the blood pressure drops. And that occurs because of the vasodilation the damage to the blood vessels, and the fluid leaking out. So there's a decrease in intravascular pressure. To compensate, the heart rate will increase, but it's unable to maintain tissue perfusion. So now the organs are not getting the oxygen they need. And without swift treatment, multiple organ failure and death can occur. So as a result of this widespread infection and inflammatory response, we now have the classic signs of shock here with a low blood pressure and a high heart rate. Swift treatment is very important. Looking at the pathophysiology, we can see this is spreading quickly. It's affecting the whole body. There's a lot going on. So it needs to be addressed quickly and monitoring for sepsis so that it can be treated quickly or hopefully prevented before it even occurs. So the signs and symptoms, first we're starting with any signs and symptoms of infection, chills, shivering, sweating, for vital signs, looking for tachycardia, hypotension, tachypnea, fever, 
Now, these could be signs of a different infection, but you never want to wait it out. You want to assess quickly and treat promptly. Additional symptoms that we'll see in later stages of sepsis, cold, clammy skin, shortness of breath, confusion, disorientation, severe pain, and organ dysfunction, and eventually organ failure. Swift treatment is very important, but what does this treatment consist of? Well, sepsis is a medical emergency. The patient would be hospitalized, often in the ICU, and the focus is on maintaining perfusion and treating the infection. So you're gonna start first by thinking about the ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation. If the blood pressure is down and the heart rate is up, we need to help the body maintain that tissue perfusion and get oxygen to the organs. So oxygen or mechanical ventilation may be needed depending on the severity of breathing issues. The patient needs IV fluids to increase blood pressure and maintain that perfusion to the organs. Additionally, vasopressors such as norepinephrine may be used to constrict the blood vessels and help increase that blood pressure. Steroids are used to reduce inflammation, such as betamethasone and IV antibiotics. So initially the treatment will start with a broad spectrum antibiotic to treat a variety of bacteria. You might be wondering how we can treat the infection if we don't know the cause. So blood cultures are performed to define the cause but even before those results are back, if they're going to, if those results are going to delay treatment, the broad spectrum antibiotic will be started because there's not a lot of time to act. So you don't want to waste any time waiting around for those results and the antibiotics will be started in order to fight the infection as quickly as possible. Once those results come back, the doctor may decide to make a change to that to fight the antigen more effectively, but you don't want to waste any time in that initial critical period. Once the patient's stabilized using these measures, the cause of the initial infection must be determined and eradicated. So where did the infection come from? Was it a wound? Was it a pick line? Was it pneumonia? The initial infection needs to be addressed and treated so that sepsis does not recur. And with proper and swift treatment, most patients are able to fully recover following a sepsis infection. But again, there's a, a very limited period of time for this treatment to occur and we do see many deaths due to sepsis because the treatment is not activated. It's not caught quickly enough that sepsis is occurring. Ideally, we wanna be focusing on preventing sepsis as much as possible, rather than having to get to that treatment stage that we just discussed and be in reaction mode and fighting against the body's inflammatory response when it's already become widespread. So it's really important to monitor all patients for any signs of infection, especially if they have any of the following risk factors, such as older age, chronic illness, invasive procedures, invasive devices. So those post-operative wounds, if you start to see an infection there, um, pick lines, IVs, making sure to keep those sites really clean using appropriate sterile technique. Um, and patients also keeping an extra close watch on patients who are immunocompromised due to HIV, chemotherapy, corticosteroid use, patients who have severe burns or who are malnourished. And if you have any concerns, trust your nursing judgment. I always encourage nurses to advocate for their patients page the doctor, keep checking the vital signs, do what you have to do to make sure this gets addressed. Don't wait for it to progress. If there's something that's concerning you, if there's an infection that's developing, um, a change in a wound, a significant mental status change, something that you're gonna notice because you're the nurse and you're the one spending that 
hands-on time with the patient, address it early. Don't wait for sepsis to develop. Certainly the importance of hand washing and preventing infection transmission cannot be overstated. Always sanitizing or washing hands anytime we're in or out of a patient's room. Following all contact precautions, the presence of these drug resistant organisms in the hospital setting in long term care, these increase the risk of sepsis. So it's very important that we're always maintaining those proper contact precautions and educating the patient and family member on the contact precautions to prevent spreading of those organisms throughout the facility and ensuring that rooms are thoroughly cleaned between patients. Using appropriate clean or sterile technique for dressing changes or invasive devices. For IVs, making sure to really clean those IV ports every use. All of the typical infection control measures, really making sure that we as nurses do our best every time to prevent any infection transmission. Other important prevention measures involve providing education to the patients and their family members about infection, signs and symptoms of infection. So notify the nurse and the doctor of any signs or symptoms of an infection developing, if there's a wound, how to assess the wound for warmth, redness, discharge, drainage. And this is important at discharge, but it's important throughout the hospital stay because it helps to have extra eyes on the patient and for the patient themselves to all be on the lookout for sepsis. We wanna do everything we can to prevent this from occurring. So bringing the patient and family into that team watching for signs of possible infection will be a big help as well. Nurses play a huge role in sepsis prevention and early treatment. And I hope this lesson helps you to take these tools out into the field and save patient lives in the process. Thank you for your time.